Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today, we hear a message focusing on the beauty of grace. The scriptures we'll be looking at are Acts chapter 15 and Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. The Life Notes are available now from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here's Pastor Chad Garrison. Take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2 is our text, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,154. That's 1154. You'll be able to follow along with us in Galatians chapter 2. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then take one with you. It is our gift to you because we want you to have God's Word, read God's Word. If you're joining us online, the offer is the same to you. You can't take it with you right now, but if you message us, we will get you a Bible. Because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, I I just have to echo Pastor Pete's shout out on the, uh, the Serve Our Schools group. Over 150 volunteers, 10 school campuses, doing an amazing job. And uh, yeah, celebrate that. I got to go and visit most of the schools today, encourage the people, and just, you know what I told them? I said, this, this is what makes Calvary the church that it is, because people are given of themselves to make our community better in the name of Jesus. And, uh, and then I'm also just celebrating what's going to happen in the morning. Uh, about 35 miles south of here, <clears throat> at our Parker campus, they're going to be launching their offi- first official weekend in their new remodeled building. And they've been waiting for that building to get finished. We've been praying for it to get finished. And tomorrow they're launching. And here's the cool thing. They're launching with two services because they're already out of space. Isn't that awesome? So... Uh, I'm so proud of what, uh, what Reuben is doing down there, Pastor Reuben, and what God is doing through his team and the ministry that he's building. And I'm, uh, I, I love being here, but man, I'm missing out being there uh, tomorrow. It's going to be a great, great day. So be praying for them and celebrating with them. Hey, in, uh, in 1775, the Massachusetts Colonial Militia and British regulars engaged in battles at Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts, which became the American Revolutionary War. And over the next six to seven years, battles were fought for freedom uh, as a nation from King George III and the nation of England. And the end result is the freest nation and the greatest country in the world today. They won, yeah, you can clap for that. See, they won the battle for our national freedom. Now, in 30 AD, in Jerusalem, Jesus of Nazareth fought a different kind of battle for freedom. His fight was against the powers of sin and death and hell, which he defeated completely through his sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Jesus set us free spiritually. I think we can celebrate that too, right? I was wondering which one was going to get more applause. (laughs) Now, in about 50 AD, once again in Jerusalem, there was a battle for freedom. And this time, it was between the adherents of religion and the proponents of grace for salvation. And this is the battle we're talking about today, the battle for freedom. The battle for freedom. Uh, now, I'm referencing Acts 15 in your notes, but I'm gonna, uh, the reason we're doing that is because we're talking about uh, the book of Acts because Paul references it in his letter to the people in Galatians. So Galatians chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 10, we're going to look at that. And, and this is a continuation of the Apostle Paul's story that uh, Pastor Pete shared last week, his story of conversion and life change that happened. And, uh, and he's continuing to tell this story to the church at Galatia and what happens next. So pick up in verse 1. He says, Then, after 14 more years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. And I went up because of a revelation and, and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles 
in order to make sure that I was not running or had run in vain. Now, in other words, Paul is saying, I've been preaching, I've been leading people to Christ, and now I'm coming back, and with the apostles, he goes, I want them to know what I've been preaching to make sure that it wasn't heresy. He knew it wasn't heresy, but he wanted, you know, as the church, he's like, I, I want to submit to the, the leadership. But even Titus, he says, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And remember, we've been talking about the truth of the gospel all, three, all these weeks in Galatians. And from those who seem to be influential, who they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me. They gave me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So what is the Apostle Paul referencing? What is he talking about all these things that were going on and uh, why is he writing this to the Galatians? That's what we need to talk about. See, in uh, AD 50, there was this thing that scholars now call the Jerusalem Council. And the Apostle Paul went there and, and, uh, to Jerusalem after being on missionary journey for months and months. He and Barnabas had gone out into the region of Galatia and other places and uh, had led hundreds, if not thousands, of people to Jesus. All of them Gentiles. Okay, or at least most of them Gentiles. Can't say all, 100%, but most of them Gentiles. And that's a problem because up to this point, about 99% of all Christians were Jews. They were Jews. They were from, you know, Israel. They were people who were there on the day of Pentecost. They were people there who saw Jesus do his ministry. And so all these people who were, you know, followers of Christ, who'd been in the church for a decade or more, that, that's what they knew. They knew that you followed Jesus and they practiced Judaism because they didn't have to give it up. And suddenly, here's the Apostle Paul showing up, and he's saying, hey, by the way, guys, thousands of Gentiles are coming to faith in Jesus. Thousands of, and, and he's preached grace alone. So here's what happened, because it presented this conflict. Acts chapter 15. By the way, if you want to turn there, it's on page 1097. I'm going to be referencing Acts 15 now more than uh, Galatians 2. Galatians 2 is a setup to get us here, just so you know. He says in 15 verse 1, But some men came down from Judea, he's in Antioch, by the way, and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, uh, you, you read into that, they had knocked down, drag out, you know, arguments. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others who were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So the church in Antioch, Paul comes back. He's telling about all the thousands that got saved. These people from Judea, Judea come, and they said, oh, no, no, no. You've got to become a Jew to become a Christian. That's what they were saying. And the question became, do you have to convert to Judaism to be a Christian? Do you have to keep the food laws? Do you have to keep the holidays? Do you have to go to the temple? Do you have to be circumcised? And the party of the Pharisees, in other words, th these, were, these were men who had been Pharisees who became believers in Jesus but continued to live as Pharisees. So they're believers in Jesus, but they're practicing all of the laws of Judaism as they did before they became a convert. And in verse 5 in Acts 15, it says, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. They were so organized, they had a party. But if some belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So there's this big debate. And it's happening now before the apostles in Jerusalem. There's a big argument, big discussion. 
And then here's what the apostles said, beginning in verse 6. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. If you want to read that, that's Acts chapter 10. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are, we, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Okay, now that's, that's the pronouncement. The apostles decided that we are saved through grace alone, provided by Jesus only. Okay, that, that was their declaration. And, and nothing else will save you. So Paul and Barnabas continued their missionary journeys, and the party of the Pharisees did not give up. Even though the apostles had said, this is the gospel, that your salvation is in Jesus Christ, believing in him only, you do not have to do anything else. These guys, the party of the Pharisees said, uh-uh, he, they're wrong. And they followed Paul around and they poisoned the, the churches. They went into the churches and they taught contrary gospel. They said, nope, what you have to do is you have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law of Moses. You have to do all these things. And that's why Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians. That's the why. That's what's going on. And now, I just want you to know, I'm thankful that the battle for freedom in Christ was decided by the apostles in 50 AD. Because of their decision, we know that we are saved by Jesus alone and not by what we do. And that means that we can eat cheeseburgers and pepperoni pizza and baby back ribs. I know, that's not the point. But it is still the point. See, because the party of the Pharisees isn't dead. You need to hear this. The party of the Pharisees isn't dead. They just changed clothes. All right? If you grew up in and around church, wait, how many of you grew up in and around church? Okay, a lot of hands. A lot of hands grew up in and around church. Then you have probably tasted the bondage of religion. The bondage of religion. Now, the question is this. If Jesus died to set us free, why are so many churches extremely legalistic? You ever wonder that? I mean, they teach, you know, if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. And yet, I'll just tell you this, my churches I grew up in, freedom was not something that they really encouraged you to, you know, live in. I mean, they had more rules than the Ten Commandments. They had a lot more things to say. Uh, but, uh, in fact, how many of you, you know, grew up in churches that loved rules? Oh, yeah. How many of you were more, you know, that you grew up in churches that were more focused on you being disciplined than joy? See, that one was the big one. Nobody ever talked about joy. Unless, you know, it was a Sunday school teacher named Joy. <laughs> then you should shut up and listen to her, okay? You know, but they put these expectations on us that felt burdensome. I have to do this. I heard that so much growing up. Well, we have to do this, and we have to do that. And you know what? When you follow Jesus, you don't have to do anything. You get to do. You get to serve. You get to do these things. So religion results in bondage. That's what Jesus set us free from. From. Listen to Peter again, Acts 15, 10. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke? We're talking about the, you know, that wooden thing that went on oxen when they were pulling the plow. Placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. He said, look, we haven't been able to keep the law. We all know that. Our, our you know, ancestors weren't able to keep the law. We all know that. We failed at it. That's why God sent Jesus to rescue us from our inability to obey because we're sinners. So here's the thing. If, if Jesus came to set us free, then why do we act like the party of the Pharisees instead of following the example of the apostles? Why are we so prone to do that as church? Because religion wants external conformity. Religion desires external conformity. Religion wants everyone to follow the same rules, the same practices, the same values. And, and religion cares more about your conformity than your life change. I want you to hear this. Religion cares more about the fact that you look like us and you act like us and you talk like us and you vote like us 
than about what's really going on inside of you. Because we want everyone to agree and everyone to look the same and come out this cookie cutter example of what it means to follow Jesus so that we can feel good about the people that are around us rather than worrying about our relationship with Jesus. And the problem is this, when we ask people to conform, then they only conform when they are with us. Not because they are convinced. People conform to religion because they want to be included, not because they are convicted that what they're doing is right. Which means they will only conform <laughs> when they're with other church people, right? But when they're not with church people, do they live out those same values? No. And so what churches have done, what religion has done is create hypocrites. By the way, you ever heard us you know, the world ever accuse us of being hypocrites? Yeah, that's because we're really good at raising up hypocrites. Because when you put pressure on people to conform rather than to experience transformation, then, then they're one thing at church and they're another thing someplace else, which is not integrity and it's not transparent living. So religion is all about external conformity. And honestly, religion is all about controlling behavior. <laughs> I grew up in a world of don't do this, don't do that. That's not allowed. You can't eat that. You can't drink that. You can't watch that. You have to do this. And, and when you said why, did anyone else ever ask why? All right, how many of you thought why, but you didn't ask it? Go ahead. Okay. Some of you are. But, but see, here's the thing. We, when you ask why, they would say because it's good for you. We're just trying to protect you. We want you to be safe from temptation. Didn't work, did it? No, it didn't work. That's not a good enough reason. You know, and, and look, the things they were in favor of, of restricting or whatever, look, it might have been better for you to follow their rules, but using the fear of hell and guilt as motivation, it's not very uplifting, is it? That's not very encouraging, is it? Whether you held that guillotine of saying, well, if you don't conform, then we're going to send you to hell. If you don't obey, then we're, you're going, going to hell. Hey, if you, don't, if you don't do this, then you should feel guilty, and you should carry that guilt. Anyone carrying guilt from, you know, those, those long-ago days of being told you're, yeah, you're supposed to feel guilty? Can I just tell you that motivation by guilt and fear is evil? Jesus never asked us to be afraid. In fact, the whole message around Jesus was do not be afraid. Jesus doesn't threaten to send us to hell. Jesus offers us life. And he doesn't try to use, you know, guilt to conform us. He tries to say, hey, look, I, I want you to follow me. It's not going to be easy, but this is the path to life. Come and follow it. He invites us to follow. Um, so motivation using fear and guilt is evil. It's not Jesus. Um, I grew up Baptist, by the way, in case you're new here and you didn't know any better if you're attending a Baptist church, but don't tell anyone, okay? <laughs> uh, we're Baptists because we do missions together. But anyway, so the, the thing is, I grew up in Baptist churches, and Baptists, uh, at least back in the day, they still are to some degree, but back in the day, they were hardcore, no alcohol. Anybody grew up with me on that? That's right. I grew up thinking that the 11th commandment was thou shalt not drink. <laughs> Imagine my surprise when they told me to, you know, read the Bible and I found out that Jesus turned water into wine. I heard exactly zero sermons on that growing up. None. And, uh, and so, you know, here's the thing. You can't drink. It's terrible for you. Uh, you know, my, my parents were against it because uh, I had a raging abusive alcoholic as a grandfather. And so they had a mo different motivation for that. But, but it worked well. And so there was this whole, you know, hey, you can't drink. You can't drink. And in fact, all the churches, you know, Baptist churches made you, if you were going to be a leader in the church, you had to sign this covenant saying, I will not drink alcohol. They started off saying, I won't even sell or drink alcohol until, you know, all the grocery stores started selling beer and then they were sunk. Everybody, I got, they had too many, you know, deacon's wives working at Kroger. So, uh, so they kind of dropped that part. But, you know, they, it was like, you, okay, we're all coming. We're not going to drink. Except, you know, I was in the youth group and I knew the kids of the deacons and I knew the kids of the teachers. And I knew the kids of the pastors. And guess what? I found out from an early age that they were hypocrites. 
because they had committed to not drinking for a non-biblical reason, but they'd committed to it, and they were lying. And their kids knew it, and the youth group knew it, and probably the leaders knew it, but they were all breaking the rules, so they weren't holding each other accountable. And, and you know what I re- came to realize now? I grew up in powerless churches because of practiced hypocrisy. Because people were being asked to conform to rules that controlled behavior that had no biblical basis at all. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Henry Nowen, who wrote a book called In the Name of Jesus. You should read it if you read books. Uh, he says this, it's easier to control people than to love people. He's talking about the church. It's easier to control people than to love people. But what does Jesus command us to do? Yeah, hey, it's, it's such a no-brainer. So religion takes the easy path that leads to bondage. But when we follow Jesus, when we confess that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, we confess that he died on the cross for our sins and was raised from the dead, and we make a commitment to follow Jesus with our lives, then we encounter the beauty of grace. The beauty of grace. I'm just going to read it again, Acts 15, 11. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. That's what we believe. We are saved by the action of Jesus on the cross when he'd suffered and died. He died for our sins and paid the debt that we could not pay and offers us salvation. And and that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. You know what that means? That means that God loves us. By the way, when we say God loves us, that means that God loves you. You. It probably should remind some of the people sitting next to you that God loves them because some of them really struggle to believe it. It means that God sent Jesus to save us, which means that God sent Jesus to save you from your sins. This is really personal. It means that Jesus forgives us of our sin. He makes us new. He changes our destiny from hell to heaven. Every single one of us who's a follower of Jesus, we were bound for hell because of our sin, because of our defiance against God. We were bound for hell. That was our one and only destiny. And Jesus changed our destiny, not because we're good people, but because he died for our sins. And he offers us a gift. Romans 6, 23 simply says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We receive this gift when we surrender our lives to Jesus and we say, Jesus, I believe, would you save me? And he does. He does. You just surrender to Jesus and he'll change your life. You can't earn this. You can't deserve this. You can't work for it. You can't pay for it. You just have to say, yes, I receive. That's grace, and, and that's, why, that's why grace makes people uncomfortable. By the way, uncomfortable grace is one of our core values here at Calvary, and I love that. Uncomfortable grace. We simply believe that followers of Jesus give the same limitless grace they have received from God. So you've been forgiven of all your sins, right? That means so have the other people around you. And everybody that you encounter, when they're followers of Jesus, they've been forgiven of all their sins. And because you've been forgiven and because they've been forgiven, guess what? We want to live in this place of grace where we forgive each other. That's uncomfortable grace. See, God's grace abounds to us and others. And by the way, that means that we encourage and we wait for internal transformation. Internal transformation that is done by the Holy Spirit See, again, religion desires external conformity, but grace is all about internal transformation. The work that only the Holy Spirit can do inside a man or woman's heart in their life when he's got ownership and he's got control because we've surrendered to him and then God will change us. But that means that we have to allow time for God to change people's lives. And, and you know what happens in church? because I've seen it, I, I, I felt it, is somebody comes and they confess Jesus and their life's a mess. By the way, all of our lives are a mess before Jesus. And then once we meet Jesus, he starts cleaning up our lives, but they're still messy. 
But what happens in church is somebody comes and they confess Jesus and we want to clean him up right now. We want to fix him right now. We want to make all this bad stuff go away and just you be, and that's where the external conformity comes in because we want to clean them up instead of waiting for God to do his incredible work. And by the way, uh, love is patient. Love is patient. Why aren't we with the work of God in people's lives? How many people have been chased away from church because they met Jesus, but the Jesus people around them didn't have any patience for their problems? So our natural inclination is to try and rush the progress, but God is waiting and God is working. By the way, uh, because we believe this, that makes Calvary a messy place of life change filled with messy people in the process of transformation. And, uh, and we're not afraid of your mess because our God is a God of life change. And by the way, I'm not afraid of your mess. And if you don't believe me, just look at my office, okay? Uh, look, God does great things through messes and through messy people. And see, part of the beauty of grace is that our primary task as people of grace is loving people. It's just loving people. I mean, this is so basic. Uh, sometimes I'm embarrassed to preach it, but Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall what? Love your neighbor as yourself. He goes, look, these, these two, these are the big two. Everything else depends on these two. Everything else hangs on these two. Everything is wrapped up in these two. So if you're loving God, then, then our, our task that he's given us is to love people, not to fix people. Some of us need to repent right now. Some of us, our marriages are on the rocks because we're trying to fix our spouse more than love them. Oh, wait, wait, it's easier to control, control people than to love people, right? Uh, it, it's not, okay, we're supposed to love people. We're not supposed to correct people's thinking. Ooh, got really quiet. Because some of us, our mission is to change everybody's mind about everything that we believe in. And that's not what we're called to do. We're called to love people. We're not trying to correct people's behavior. God did not call you to be everybody's mom. He called you to love. And so while religion wants to control behavior, grace is committed to loving people. And that means that we are patient. That means we are kind. That means we don't envy. We don't boast. We aren't proud. We aren't rude. I mean, how much more powerful would we be if the people of God if we were just patient, kind, and not rude? You're like, not rude. Yeah, I mean, like, not rude, even when you're driving. <laughs> Wait, this is even harder. Not rude, even when you're on the phone with customer service. <laughs> ah, yeah, the Word of God applies all the time. All the time. See, loving, me, loving people means that we treat pe all people, everyone, with patience, kindness, and tell them the truth. Patience, kindness, and tell them the truth. The truth is that God loves them, that God offers redemption, that God will forgive their sins, that God will save them from hell. And it means that if they submit to Jesus, then he will give them eternal life. That's what it means. And that's why we're on a mission to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's why we're a people of grace, not a place of religion. That's why we'll continue to fight the battle for freedom. Because grace wins. Grace won in 50 AD because God made sure it did. And grace wins in my life and grace wins in your life. And that's why grace declares us winners. Let's live as the people of grace. Let's pray. Father, thanks for saving us. We don't deserve it. There's not a thing we could do to pay you back but you have loved us, you have redeemed us by the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross for me and for all of us. And God, we praise you for that. 
And, and we want to live differently, not because we have to, but because we love you and because you have loved us and we want to live in gratitude. We want to live in grace. We want to live in service. And God, we really do want to be patient and kind and not rude. So just change us from the inside. God, help us not to look at our neighbor or our friend or our spouse and think you really need this. God, this is for us. So let us hear it. We open up our hearts and our minds to your spirit right now for him to apply your word to us and we will surrender and we will obey and we will follow you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Tyndale Bible Dictionary defines grace as the gift of God as expressed in his actions of extending mercy, loving kindness, and salvation to people. Grace is also defined as undeserved favor. It cannot be earned. It is a gift of God. If you have questions about the message, would like prayer, or would like to speak to a pastor about following Jesus, may I encourage you to email us at questions at calvaryaz.com. One of our pastors will get in touch with you. Well, that'll do it for today. Have a great week and come back to join us next weekend. Bye-bye.